all stashed down the stairs. So I, I know I have one of these because I came across it a week or so ago. Where's the one? You gotta remember where. Oh, I got this one too. Yeah, yeah that's, that's the next door. Got that. Got that. Don't tread on me. Yeah. You remember Johnny Russell? You're missing yeah. some. You're missing some. <laughs> Well, well, I'm sure he's only missing like about 20,000. He's missing like, a rise in the bank. He's got a lot more gold in the bank. Okay, that was like the second one. Yeah, that was like the second one. The first one was like all yellow. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Hello. The gun was much more powerful. He was looking. Keep talking. Okay. Um, we spying on you, you know. Okay. Do you remember any of the trials? Uh, like the, the, uh, Chicago 15. The the Chicago 15, I don't remember that one. This is when there was a conspiracy trial. Oh yeah, here's Hoffman. Hoffman, yeah. I remember joining the conspiracy or this one here. Conspiracy Chicago. Okay. But uh, yeah, they, you just passed me this bus. Ah, okay. Any memories connected with those that you would have marches related? What? Well, this is like the second. Related to that? This is the second button of Rising Up Angry. Some of us still have the copies of this. The first one was like all yellow. We can't remember that. I think I had the same too. symbol. Um, I don't really remember associating like particular buttons with demonstrations or events, but um, remember VVAW, Vietnam Veterans Against the War, the Science to the People. Remember opposing Agent Orange? Oh, no, no. Uh, here, starting uh, in 1967, well, and then in 71 was published. That's what Mickey thinks uh, Rod died of, Agent Orange. I guess he had, well, you know, he got seriously wounded and yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, seriously. He was pretty beat up, but... never was right. No, uh, yeah, his forearm was totally right. trashed, yeah. Science to the people? Shaggy got his gun. That's a Dolphin Tumbo movie. Yeah. And books. Two movies. Z. Yeah, these were these were very significant movies. Um, Dalton Trumbo was blacklisted. And then uh, it's about a guy who gets all shut up in World War I and is blinded and disabled and restricted, you know, living in a bed now. of these, but, you know, they're not actually, well, the fist button was, uh, that was a very common button. A lot of people wore this button back in the late 60s, well, probably early 70s, I think. And then fuck the draft. That was, a, that was really a good button to wear. You're going out in the neighborhoods or trying to organize people and that you talk real easily about the, the, the war. People didn't want to be, uh, you know, they didn't want to be drafted. They didn't want to go in and fight the war. So it's really a way to make connection with people. What's this? 300 more today, I don't know. Where's right now, Penguin? And stop the war machine. That was another button that was really common. Like, oh, oh, we already talked about that. Today. Well, who made the button? How many of them were made? How many of these were made? How many were made? When was it made? Who made it? Uh, well, it was early on because it has the gun in it. Yeah, I think this was like the second button. I think we put out. The first one was all yellow. Yellow. Yeah, I have a, one of each. I've lost a couple. Of Actually, I have one in the exhibit room at the ball. They had buttons. Do you, you got rid of the gun or you added the gun? The gun came off and we got into service. Or rain or stop using bullets. Is that yellow conspiracy the conspiracy aid or what is that? You remember the Berrigan brothers? When they, yeah, yeah, yeah. They were charged with trying to kidnap Henry Kissinger. Uh, no, they were trying to kidnap Kissinger. Ekbal Ahmad here.
in Chicago with the co-conspirators. Today, Kissinger, tomorrow, the Easter Bunny. <laughs> It was always good to try to humiliate the powers that be with funny stuff because they had no sense of humor and they would always look worse. Well, here's a conspiracy, Chicago. Yeah. And these two here is Judge Julius, Julius Hoffman, who is the judge of the Conspiracy 8 trial. I'm rising up, which people commonly refer to as Conspiracy 7, like Poppy Seal disappearing. <laughs> Uh, the thing is that Rising Up Angry was at the uh, conspiracy trial. Yeah, because that trial started, I think, in late 69, if I remember, when in the 1970. So, it's very cool. What's this? The day after, TDA. That was a, a tactic to get people mobilized. TDA is what? The day after, TDA. Okay. So that was, if, once the verdict came down, there was a huge demonstration. And there were other demonstrations like, uh, I don't know if it's a microphone. I don't know. 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 I saw who were organized at the rallies. And I've, I've got some pictures of some of those rallies we had. Phil Oaks used to sing. Phil Oaks used to sing. He used to sing at uh, the, the conspiracy trial rallies. And there was a place called the church, the church, the glass front called Christ the King Church, where we hold press conferences. Uh, who's we? Well, supporters of the conspiracy. And, you know, people would come out of the trial afterwards and comment about what happened in court. And we'd have rallies in, in the, uh, uh, you know, the Federal Building Plaza. And, um, uh, well, sometimes there'd be riots during that to break us up. At the Federal Building? At the Federal Building, you know. I guess usually what they would do is they try to limit the size. Start spilling over into the streets and stopping the buses. The cops would come in and tear gas in the face. And there were numerous little riots like that over the trial. I, I learned, I was studying constitutional law at Metro High School with the ACLU um, during the appeal period. And I was almost studying that at Judge that you can tell, tell us about? Um, well, let's see. Um, well, tell us this. Uh, I know you told me off camera, but tell me about Martin Luther King and the role that it, it got involving you in politics. Well, when Dr. King organized uh, open housing marches, uh, one of the targets was uh, the, was the last white bastions in the southwest side. Park, where I went to the summer school, and um, Marquette Park was a huge park in the south of side down. And south of there was Hogan High School, where, um, where I lived. And um, the CCCO um, was organized by the Southern Christian leadership and local community groups. There was a coordinating committee between the various community organizations. 
Dr. King, after living in Chicago for a year, gave up. What was it? He gave up what? He gave up organizing Chicago, and then he started focusing on the Vietnam War and poverty. And that's where they went after him. Uh, because um, that was going after Northern racism combined with closing the Vietnam War, where he was a little traitor for a lot of people. And then taking on the class and poverty issue and working with Southern whites, that's what really got him killed over the last three nails in his project. Uh, but uh, it's noted, though, that the, the local community organizations had a keener understanding of the prospects for housing and pushing the open housing ordinance. It wasn't until Dr. King was killed that the open housing ordinance, watered down goal it was, was actually enacted. So they, they got some, some, uh, you know, uh, they got some victory, but uh, not really, because, uh, you know, the town is still scientifically segregated according to ethnic groups. And, uh, you know, when, when um, the um, sides in my neighborhood were negotiating the SCLC, Dr. King's negotiators, um, on one side of the table, included um, uh, number of uh, well, Tell me, tell me what your, your, your house is used as a negotiating place. Yeah, yeah, our, our, yeah, when, when the sides were negotiating, our basement was used for the, for the sides. Because your parents? Because my parents were active with the uh, Ashland Human Relations Council. And uh, so uh, CCCO and SCLC's organizers were on one side of the table, and the white community had their representatives, including Reverend Vernon Lyons of Ashland Baptist Church. Now he was a white man or a black man? White. He was, uh, he was from... One of the churches that grew out of segregation. They had buses that brought you know, uh, parishioners and students to his church simply because they were in a white neighborhood. And, and basically, in fact, grew out of segregation. And then there were several members of the Nazi party that came in with their swastikas on. One of them was George Lincoln Rockwell, who a couple of years later would be assassinated by one of the good members. At any rate, so uh, after, somewhere after that, we got a cross burned on our lawn one midnight. All of us burned down the house. The fuel got on the And uh, Instead of going and finishing at Hogan, I went to uh, Metro High School, the Chicago Public High School for Metropolitan Studies, or the Chicago School of Ball. It started in 1970, and we used to use the city as a laboratory. I started at Second City and Playwright Center. I worked as uh, an intern in Andrew Mickler's office at, at ACLU for you know, constitutional law. In African American history, the West Side visited the Black Panther headquarters a few months after the assassination of Nathan Mark Clark, and and also uh, visited the headquarters of uh, Rising Up Anger. My mother lived on the North Side, and she used the clinic, and you know, really associated with the group. So I got to know a few of the people back then, and. Uh, 
Joe Pencil, head of the Vietnam Veterans Against the War, he's still around the, the Bay Area. My brother passed on six years ago. I need to get down on tape. Uh, say your name, spell your last name, give your date of birth and your and your place of birth. Just for the record. My name is Robert uh, Rudner, R U D N E R. I was born on July 8, 1952, uh, south side of Chicago. And lived on the southwest side half of my life and the rest on the north side. represents how many years? Well, this is from uh, 68 to uh, 75. After that, I had some of the buttons from various protests of uh, post-Vietnam incursions, like into Central America, and over the Shah of Iran, and also the People's Bicentennial Committee, uh, the BBC People's Bicentennial Committee, which was organized by, locally by, Johnny Ross. Would you point it out again? Could you point out that button? Don't tread on me. Johnny uh, also put out the little red, white, and blue button. Patriotic Club. Who are you talking about? Johnny Ross. He was he owned uh, Three Penny Cinema and Liberty Hall, where the IWW had its headquarters for a while and SDS had its headquarters for a while. He claimed to be the oldest member of, of the SDS. He was a Lincoln Brigade for the Spanish Civil War for the six other guns. Can you spell his last name? R O S S C N. Johnny Appleseed Ross. People in this group would remember. <laughs> so I, uh, that's sort of towards the end. What was the People's Bison? Is Bison they, they basically organize out of Washington D.C. and, and organize uh, sort of demonstrations uh, relating to the original revolutionary spirit of the founding of the country, while protesting the wrapping uh, of the red, white, and blue, the use of. Uh, American flag and mental block, you know, you stick it in one ear and yank it out the other. And so they had that book, quotations. Yeah. Uh, the little red, white, and blue book of uh, revolutionary American quotations. And I spread that book around along with issues of uh, rising up angry and being south and side, along with uh, Thomas Paine's common sense. And uh, still finding a way very engaging book. So there's, there's, we've always had the spirit of revolution in this country. I just wanted to again. What about this? Uh, what was that? An event? So this is to uh, remember uh, 68. Well, uh, you know, 40 years ago, um, we had a demonstration to make sure people didn't forget. And then there was the beginnings of the conspiracy trial. A, a treaty with uh, North Vietnam. There were various groups that were sending negotiation teams over. The um, point program, you know, signed the treaty. And um, you know, people were trying to basically break through the whole racism to um, end the bombing. And there was, yeah, uh, there was a. Uh, there was resistance in, in the military, a guy named Priest, who had a number of trials. Was there a, a person named Priest? Yeah, this guy, guy named Priest, who, who was opposing the war. I think he was in the Navy. And people from BBAW, uh, Amnesty, uh, one of the next phases. We pushed for Amnesty and ended up with Amnesia. Amnesia. This 
one of my favorite screw machines. This one a lot. I wore these. these uh, it kind of have uh, every memory. This button was in a button rack, and it's really supposed to be for the buttons. But they were selling out of buttons fast enough to just <laughs> an aggravation button. I got that at a head shop in uh, on, on, uh, in, on Wells. And the trial is. That's the conspiracy trial. They used to have their headquarters over Liberty Hall for a while. Well, tell me about your contact with the IWW. Those are the robberies? Well, during the last SDS convention in Chicago, I, there was a table. Um, there was a table. Had, and I got to meet some of the old time organizers. And I didn't, I didn't really have a faction. Uh, I, I described myself as a libertarian socialist. And I thought, for a joke, I was making up that name because of self contradiction. And this guy who was worked with IWW uh, said, I was in the Libertarian Socialist Party in 1926. So actually, somebody else is a joke, perhaps, thought of it before I did. And it's good to know that there were people with a sense of humor in the SDS, because at that time, the Progressive Labor Party was taking over, and, you know, it had to be in the coach of the German mom. They weren't saying it. And I guess at that time, people weren't taking themselves much too seriously. It was a tremendous marginal complex of our generation. And uh, people thought they'd be killed. So they took themselves off too seriously, I think. So they're kind of a mixed reflex. Yeah. Okay, could you tell me, was it IWW, this Rawson guy? Uh, I, I believe... Uh, uh, the book about him. He started, the, he started off as debating at the Dill Pickle and opened up a college of complexes. Tell him what is the College of Complexes? Well, the College of Complexes is a debating group where people would just come and speak for dinner. You'd get a free dinner if you spoke. And so he started that in 1951, uh, Slim Brundage. And uh, so he hung out with the IWW members. And, um, you know, I think he died in uh, uh, um, where was the College of Complexes? The College of Complexes meets over at uh, the Lincoln Restaurant every Saturday at 8 they have speaker. Still there, still, still going on. So still, still going on. It's the oldest continuous debate society in Chicago. There used to be a lot of people who built that. Uh, the late Franklin Rosemont uh, wrote a book about it. And uh, so it was, it was a club that attracted a lot of radicals. And they have people right and left. I have to say that recently it's been mostly from the right from the libertarians. And it gets a little too far from the right from my stomach. And one of the controversial things that uh, Brundage did was he invited George Lincoln Rockwell. So, you know, who's one of those people we had over in our basement. <laughs> As a speaker, and he lost members after that. But you know, the excuse was, well, you want to hear the other side, so you have to stomach it and give everybody a chance to speak. So, it's a kind of what do you say was a, a debating society? Was it someone giving a presentation, or was it two people saying, first Ask him what he remembers. Sometimes, sometimes, sometimes they would have a debate with each other. But usually what they'd have is a room full of hecklers. And the speaker would get done, and then there would allow for questions and then for comments. And it was difficult to tell the difference between the two. The questions had to end with the question. But uh, quite often these 
more speakers would be flambe. And, um, so, you know, I've spoken there in a number of times, uh, usually in uh, questions of uh, ecology, energy, power. Are you with the uh, Green Party? Yeah, I, I was one of the founders of the Chicago Green in 1987, back when we had a nice relationship with Harold Martin. Is rising up angry at this college of the complexes? I, I, I wonder. It's a good thing to ask around. Uh, it was going at the time, I believe. I think it was with Mr. Steer at that time. Uh, you've, you've, been been involved, you've been involved in many groups. Uh, what, what percentage of effort did you put into rising up angry? I mean, you seem to be very into everything. Well, uh, well, I like their paper because it's a little more to the left than the seat, which is a little more candy coated. And from that same culture, though, it was um, the alternative culture. And it was aimed towards working class stiffs like I live with. And uh, so the, the publication appealed to the people I passed it off to. Are you a greaser? No, no, I, I was, I was a, a definitely a freak. I mean, it, it was probably biological. Uh, I, uh, it stood out sort of a little bit different, uh, kind of an outsider, honestly, like, for some reason. Uh, but uh, I, I related very, very strongly the idea that in order to really complement the militancy going on, Amongst people of color, that poor working class people needed to organize much in the same way, and you know, along the same lines of militancy in the grassroots up. The Rising Up Angry is one of the groups that did that. Did you reach out to greasers with Rising Up Angry, or were you an observer from the, from the outside, like you say? Yeah, the, the greasers in, in my neighborhood liked us, and like there was. Where the kind of the hippie crowd would hang out and mix in with places, you know, uh, South Side culture, you know, beer drinking and so on. And so that match from Reaper was popular too. And, um, there was a coach uh, organized uh, 63rd Street, uh, the Lively Ward Bookstore, which spread a lot of. Reading literature, the left and alternative people around, including uh, steal this book, you know, the yippie stuff. I work more with the yippies than I did with Rising Up Angry. I gravitate more towards them, stuck with them for years until they kind of dissolve. I, I know a lot of the old, what I call latter day yippies, because the dividing line came down in 69, and a lot of the old yippies scattered, and the, and the younger yippies. And too young to be yippies came in. And during the 70s, they were confronting uh, the uh, same thing Garden Plot, Cone Telpro, you know, the counterintelligence operations were still going on full strength. And so the yippies were pretty good at confronting that and doing it with a sense of humor. It's the only way to survive. <laughs> and, uh, so that was kind of people I hung out with, they had to cross. Sure. Okay. I'm going to... Uh...